Well, Dr. Patty, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much, Keith, for having me. It's a beautiful day here in El Paso, Texas. Sunny day, even in December. So um, <laughs> with the sun, there's always wonderfulness, right? So thank you. <laughs> That's true. I, I, we have sun here, but it's a little colder, probably in the 30s here in Iowa. So. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love to ask my guests this question, kind of get a chance for the audience to yeah. know you. So what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? So that's a great question. And thank you for asking that. Um, you know, as a business owner, I've had my business now for four years and I kind of, you know, you were juggling a lot of different things and um, items. And I think the best advice that um, whether you're in an entrepreneurship role like myself or you're a leader in an organization or even a leader in your own community is like anything really to find something that you're passionate about, something that fills that inner passion in you and do that at the highest level of excellency that you can. I feel that in our organization, um, so I'm a co-founder of an organization called El Puente Institute, which translates to the bridge, which is wonderful that you're becoming a bridge builders. I love that there's a connection already there. Um, El Puente, the bridge, is an institute where we help bridge the, the Latino community with our allies, bridge the Latino community consumer workforce with their leaders and their organizations. And so we've been very excited to be able to do this kind of work, especially in this um, time where DEI has shot up and shot down. And, you know, it's just kind of in creating its own evolution. And we love that our work is, is also evolving with it. Um, but we do it with passion, right? Because it's part of our community. We're part of the community. And so if you can do anything, find that passion, find that drive, um, translate it into action, translate it into impact, then I think that's, you know, the best advice that I can give someone. And sometimes it comes very easily. I'm sure, Keith, you you probably know that finding that that passion and that impact in, that you have in today's world is, it might require a little bit of, hunting and looking and seeing what works, um, maybe some failures, which is okay too, right? Because we learn from that, but then ultimately to keep keep that uh, tenacity and that perseverance to find um, your place in this world. And I think once you can do that, sky's the limits. Off the topic a little bit, but I think for, for my audience who's kind of, um, a lot of them are Anglo. I think we sometimes try to make sure we, we address people and culture is the right way. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear a, a flip oftentimes in the com in your community from Hispanic or Latino. Can is there a is there a faux pas for like don't use that one term or <laughs> <laughs> I just always curious about yeah, that. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, um and that's a great question. I think that's a very honorable question to ask any, you know, community, right? And so the one thing that we always love to explain to anybody that's not part of the Latino community is that Latinos are not monolithic, right? We are so different. We're a mosaic of different skin colors. We're a mosaic of different um, um, countries of origin, right? Like there's more than 28 or so countries of origin that represent the U.S. Latino population. Um, as far as skin colors, like we do have Afro-Latinos and even I have an amazing uh, colleague of mine who's Argentinian and she has blue eyes, blonde hair. And so that's one of the first things we, you know, that we always like to communicate is that we are not all the same, right? Some of us are born in the U.S. Some of us are not born in the U.S. Some of us are immigrants. Some of us are first generation where our parents migrated here to the U.S. So there's a lot of factors that um, create the individual identity of a Latina or a Latino. And so, yes, there's a lot of terms, right? There's Latino, Hispanic, thanks to the Census Bureau, there's Latin, there's Latinx. The really, what we always like to educate our, our allies and um, people of the, that are not part of a community is that Hispanic, the definition of Hispanic is a, a person who comes from a country where Spanish is the prominent language, right? So that's Hispanic. Latino is the Spanish word that indicates the person comes from a Latin American country of origin. So those are kind of the difference between those two main identifiers in our community. But the big thing is ask the person, right? Let the person define for themselves how they like to be addressed. Um, also consider the geographic area that the person comes from. And, and um, it's really just to start that conversation with, I know you're from the Latino community, Hispanic community. How would you like to be addressed? And people will tell you, you know, I like the term Latinx, 
or I don't mind Hispanic or Latino. Personally, for me, Hispanic and Latino, I go for both of those words. Um, and so I really think it's a personal, a personal uh, question. And so don't be afraid to ask. And so thank you for asking that question. But yeah, there's, we're not all the same. We're not a monolithic uh, group of individuals. It's a beautiful mosaic of so many people that share one language of Spanish also. And not always though, because like right. the country of Belize is an English speaking country, although they're right. a Latino country, right? So they are, there's little, little nuances to it all. Um, but we, and you know, like for someone from Brazil like, who speaks Portugal, Portuguese. what would they would, where would, I guess it's kind of funny. Where would they fall into that category? Wow. Yeah. That'd probably be, um, Latino because they come from a Latin American origin, right. Versus Hispanic where Spanish is a predominant language. Right. But maybe the Brazilians don't even want to be considered Latino. Yeah. I think right. it's personally, you know, it's a <laughs> personal choice. Like I'm Mexican American. So I was born here in the U S but my parents were born in Mexico and, and came, uh, migrated over. So I'm first generation. So yeah, there's a lot of nuances, but, um, we like Mexican Americans like to be called Chicanos or Chicanas, <laughs> especially Texans because I'm from okay. Texas. And so, yeah, a lot of different words. So you just can ask and then you'll, you'll open the, the box of, of knowledge. <laughs> Well, that's very helpful, you know, because I get that question sometimes as an African-American. Mm -hmm. What do you want to be called? And it's like, we used to go with African-American, but now when, when you have an influx of African immigrants, they kind of have taken the term African-American. Right. So it's kind of like it gets really squishy. It in does. Terms of... <laughs> and in this You're world right, of DE&I, when we're trying to create inclusivity, right, and belonging, I think for any culture, it's really taking the time to ask the individual themselves, like, for you, for your, based off your lived experience, how would you like us to be, how would you like to be addressed? Um, I right. think that's really crucial in organizations and in leaders uh, that do take the time to get to know um, their workforce, their diverse workforce in that manner. At least for Latinos, we're all about family. So if you want to get to know me, I'm happy to talk about, <laughs> you know, family, <laughs> things like that. So Latinos are very relational. Uh, we really value these deep relationships, but it does require that person to come out of kind of their own comfort zone and say, um, tell me a little bit about you. Tell me a little bit about your family. You know, where did you grow up and things like that? Yeah. But we love that. We love relationships. I love that. I, I, I was like to ask my guest this question, kind of your story. I'm, I think everybody's story is unique. So kind of tell us your personal story, your journey into where you started and, and where you are now. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Thank you again for asking. So I'm originally from El Paso, Texas. It's a beautiful border city, sun city full of family, community. Um, and we are really the, I always give the fun fact about El Paso, we're the only city in the United States that borders two, two countries and two states all at the same time. So we border Mexico and the U.S., and then we border Texas and New Mexico. And so El Paso is really nicely placed um, born and raised here as a predominantly Hispanic community. So the topic about diversity, equity, inclusion, um, you know, microaggressions, different topics, colorism as comes up, was not really discussed. And is really even to, in today's Latino family, not a topic at the table, if we want to say. And so um, I grew up here and ended up now moving to college in Minnesota, of all places. And so I ended up in beautiful, non-sunny Minnesota, but full of beautiful snow and everything like that. A little bit of a culture shock um, and was able to attend a private college down in Minnesota. Uh, just due to a lot of different factors, um, it didn't quite work out in the way that being a minority or student of color would have thought that the that was that journey for me. So did end up coming back to El Paso, finishing at our beautiful University of Texas at El Paso, which is a tier one research uh, university, by the way. Um, and um, finished here, started a career, and was had the privilege of being part of the military family. I did marry into a military soldier and had a amazing experience in the East Coast, traveling with my husband as a military spouse being part of that community of, a mil of the military, the army was wonderful, being exposed to different cultures and, and um, different groups and really creating our own family as um, other military uh, families do in their journey and their time in the military. I um, knew I wanted to get my doctorate. That was a big part of my goal. As a Latina, we're a very small percentage of Latinas. I think it's about eight to 9% of Latinas specifically gain that highest level of education. And I knew that was a goal I wanted to do 
And so did end up in the field of industrial organizational psychology, which is business psychology. So I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I am a business psychologist and knew that this field was the right field for me. So that turned into my master's, my doctorate in psychology, and now my business where we focus on helping organizations, C-suite leaders, be prepared for the new future workforce. Um, this new future workforce is multicultural by 2050. As a researcher, I'm going to give you some stats, Keith, and your and your and your listeners some stats. That by 2050, uh, the United States population will be 60% multicultural, right? A lot of large percentage of that will be Latino, um, and so it's shifting, and it's going to shift quicker, I think, than we think or than the numbers are saying. So, are we prepared to lead in a multicultural and cultural competency manner um, as leaders of these workforces to recruit and retain? Um, the employment and the employees that we have. So I think my story's gone from being part of a beautiful community, being exposed to, um, unfortunately, the discrimination uh, that does come up with being a minority in this country, um, being able to overcome, being able to continue my role, uh, my goals uh, as, as becoming an academic, as a doctor, and then now giving back, uh, creating that impact like I talked about at the beginning, to my community um, and be really an honoring not only the skill sets and the education that I have, but also just the, the, the love of life and the love of family that this work helps us bring to organizations as well. So I'm, I feel blessed and I thank um, God and the universe for all of these blessings because uh, I know I didn't do it by myself. And so um, that's a little bit uh, about my journey and now just continuing, continuing this work. I'm always curious when someone like yourself has been as driven as you are, what do you, what would you say kind of in, in the Simon Sinek kind of thing? What is your why? <laughs> Ooh, what is my why? I think my why is to continue paving the pathways, honoring those that have come before us that have started the paving of pathways of equality, of empowerment, of women empowerment, of Latina empowerment, of our community, Latino community empowerment. There have been many, many people before us that have started, and I kind of visualize it as like a beautiful road, but it's requiring us to, each of us, to put a shovel down in the road and make a pathway and put a shovel down in the road. And my why is to contribute to that shoveling and then make it just a little bit more illuminated, right, with the, the, the challenges and the, the, um, the challenges and just the triumphs that come. With, with going down a pathway such as mine so that others can come through. Um, because I, as, as you and I know in this work of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the pathways are, are hard. And the more that we can all together collectively create that pathway, illuminate that pathway, prepare others coming through, um, what a success that would be at the end. So my why is to continue paving pathways for women, for Latinas, for my community, and for others that um, have shared that same lived experience as I have. My experience when, when I talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion is it's shifting over the last few years. It, mm -hmm. it was probably maybe more accepted a little bit earlier, but now there's so much controversy around it its purposes, the people, the feelings that it, it raises in people who are maybe not as diverse. So as you're, you're experiencing with your research, what are some common denominators about the diversity space that you could share that would help people kind of better navigate it in a positive way? I think one of the biggest things that um, we see in the research and it's talked about is the concept of lived experience and respecting everybody's own lived experience. I think if we could start conversations from there, there would be a different outcome that would come through. Because if we think about a Caucasian American's lived experience, it's different from a Latino American or Latino immigrant's lived experience. But creating that curiosity from that perspective will allow for people to share and have that psychological safety to share what it is my lived experience looks like. And then respecting that it's going to be different. And all these concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion is around, is around respecting and accepting and appreciating differences, right? And so I think, unfortunately, through a lot of influences, it's kind of gotten a little bit 
you know, messed up like a salad, I guess. I don't know. Um, and it's really our part as practitioners in this DEI um, field to be able to start peeling back the onion and simplifying it back again. So one is respecting each other's lived experience. Another thing um, that the research is, I mean, they, even Simon Sinek, a lot of these amazing um, influencers talk about going into conversations with curiosity versus judgment. Um, so really exercising that. Um, right now, the research is kind of all over the place as well. So I think there is a slight confusion of where now D, E, and I, and B, and there's other, there's other like, uh, you know, letters that are being added, where it all stands. Um, but if your audience are all leaders currently in organizations, the biggest thing for these leaders to do is to just step into their own backyard. Right. And really start assessing what that looks like in their own organization and having conversations with people in their organizations, ass uh, assessing um, whether or not there is true representation in their organization. What are the challenges that are holding them back from not having this representation? Are they bringing the right culturally competent leaders to their team? That's huge. Um, what does that even mean in their organization? So really, leaders can do this work in their organizations, it is going to take an intentionality. And so intentionality is another, another mindset that's required now, I think, in DE&I work, is the intentionality required to just understand what is really happening and the sentiments of their workforce and the people they serve. I think we always, we talk about the workforce and sometimes we forget, well, who are the people that they're serving that are actually clients, right, or customers? Um, and so also what are those sentiments? So Spending time and budgeting money um, on this topic is also a needed thing. I know a lot of budgets uh, cuts got happen or happen, especially you know Texas. There's a, you know things have happened in Texas where budget budget and DE and I and you know it's evolved. Um, it, it's work that still needs to get done and it can't be forgotten. There is another concept, real quick, Keith. That's happening. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's the concept of power. Mm. It really is. There's a power. Uh, I don't want to say it's a power struggle or a. it's just exercising of power and privilege that's happening right now at its maximum for the fear of what the future is, is coming to be, which is multicultural. So I do see right. that. Um, it's not in the research. <laughs> this is just my own, you know, uh, professional um, observation. Obser yeah, observation. Yeah. <laughs> that there is an exercise of power that's happening right now. Because there's fear. If we think about, we're all human. And we think about Maslow, right? The Maslow hierarchy of needs. Um, right under, there's food, water, survival. Then there's, you know, fear, safety, feeling safe. That's being exercised right now in different ways from both, both sides. So. Sure. I want to talk about your company that, that you founded, your CEO and founder of Bridgeify. So tell us what the vision and mission of that company is. I'm just curious for the audience to know. Yeah, so the Bridgeify Group is, we are a research firm that focuses on bridging research with practice. So as you know, Keith, also being part of the academic world in your, in your journey, um, there's a lot of information out there. Academic information, which we call primary sources, to secondary sources, which are like Harvard Business Review, and other, other reports that come through LinkedIn, if someone's on LinkedIn. Um, so we understand and, and value the concept of translating this information into bite-sized pieces that practitioners, leaders, anybody in the workplace can utilize to inform their decision, their strategy sessions or making strategic planning sessions. They're, it's being informed by information and evidence. And we are basing all of this off of the concept in the academic world of evidence-based practice. So we not only, you know, include our own lived experience of, I think this works, but we're also, I think this works. And this evidence also provides us this uh, foundation of information. And so the Bridgeify Groups helps organizations and leaders bring that research leg or research side to their decision-making model. Um, and so we're super proud of that, uh, of our team, which are also IOs, industrial organizational psychologists. Also, many of them are PhDs, um, but we are practitioners at heart. <laughs> we always say that we're practitioners at heart. Um, and so the Bridgeify Group does have three divisions to it. And one of them is the Institute of El Puente Institute. So much data out there. And we, unless you love research, 
you don't have time to go look up all the research. Right. So for you to for you to take the research and to collect it for us and then help us to interpret it really does make that a powerful thing. Because you, as a company, you can then make you know decisions based on on research and foundational mm -hmm. material, not just well, I guess this is what's going to happen, as opposed to having not having the data to back up your decision. So I think that's really helpful. Yes, I always tell my clients when you need to be in, uh, you need to be digital information seekers, right? Because you're right, there's information being thrown at us from all social media platforms and you know areas, um, and sometimes leaders are making you know reactive decisions based off of oh so and so told me this works, oh I heard that this worked or I read this article, not taking a step back to say but does it work for us, our organization, <laughs> our people, right? Um, our, our industry, our customer base, that thinking needs to happen. That'll save them money, which I know is a big part <laughs> of, of, of organizational effectiveness. It's going to save them money. It's going to save them time. Um, it'll save them possibly not losing people because there's so much change happening. Um, so they can be proactive in their, in their work versus reactive. And I think, unfortunately, the pandemic sparked that reactive um, behavior and a lot of leaders, rightfully so, right? Because of the situation and what was happening. However, we have to step back and now post pandemic, post COVID, that reactiveness can, is not going to serve them any longer. Um, and so it's really time for them to reset their own, uh, CEO mindset to be more proactive, gather information, be very vigilant, intentional, um, then making these decisions because they're impacting their workforce. And yeah, we know people are like, See, ya, I'm leaving, right? I mean, yeah, people right. are now exercising that <laughs> that right, right? I mean, the silent quitting that's going on, and and so, um, and it takes about I think the number is three times the salary of the person they lost to regain a new person. So if we start right. putting numbers on, you know, on the table, that's a lot, lot of money. It is. I love that. I love that you're doing that because, <laughs> you know, for most most of us, we think about statistics and research is like. The, the researchers joke is 90% of our research is, is bogus. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's not all like that. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah. Yes. So yes. You, you wrote a book and I want to talk about that because I think it's really helpful for the audience to have resources too, that you're a contributor to the book is Hispanic okay. uh, Star Rising, A New Face of Power. So tell us about that project. Yeah, so I, I did not write the book. I was part of the book with other Latino leaders in the U.S. So the Hispanic Star is a program done by a, an organization called We Are All Human. And so their, their main purpose in, um, on a national scale is to really amplify the voices of the Latino community and the leaders that are in the Latino community. I think, unfortunately, a lot of the stereotypes that you only find Latino leaders in service, uh, you know, industries and Latinos are only in um, are like maids and things like that. I think what they're trying to do is really shift that stereotype to, to showcase the true reality of the Latino community, how educated we are, how there are leaders out there doing impact. And so I had the privilege of sharing my story in this story of other stories of Latinos. So the book is really um, a gathering of Latino leaders, voices, and successes of our journey of how we became Hispanic stars in today's, you know, national uh, platform. And so it was a, an honor to be part of this. I think they have another, other two more volumes of the Hispanic star, which is wonderful. Um, you know, Keith, for the Latino community, it's really hard for us to what they say to your own horn, right? We're, right. we're taught to be very humble. We're taught to be very, you know, just kind of sit, put your head down, work, you know, don't cause any ruckus type of thing. Um, and so they're really also trying to help change that mindset that we have so many superpowers in our, what we call Latinidad, which is our Latin identity, um, that we do need to be proud of and we do need to speak up and we do need to share. Um, I think that comes with the community, just this humbleness that we're taught to be, but it's a new time and um, it's a new time for our community to speak up and show the amazing work that we do. And so we're seeing that now in people like America Ferreira, like doing the Barbie movie and, you know, there's, they're doing that now more. And, and so um, this is another effort to help create the voices and amplify the voices of, of the Latino community. That's awesome. As a female Hispanic Latino leader, what was it like for you trying to break through in the business sector as a person of color? 
Yeah, that's a, a also another a great question. And I think I probably share the story with a lot of other women of color coming into this business world. Um, you know, I think it's a it's a long journey. And it's a journey with, again, a lot of triumphs, but it's a journey that's requiring a lot of paving for other, you know, women of color to come after us as we continue to pave the right road, the the, the equitable road that we should, um, that we all deserve as women of color in this business um, in, industry of being a business owner. And so I think for me, it's been um, breaking stereotypes, you know, showing up to a room and taking up space. Um, I've done a lot of inner work for myself because as Latinas, we are taught to be very self-serving, nurturing, um, humble again, right? Not to cause, don't, don't push the status quo. Um, and so I've had to, kind, I've had to also do a lot of individual empowerment work to know that my voice is important. Our voice does matter. And so um, been able to do that, have a great support system of people, professionals, as well as colleagues, as well as other women of color that have come before me to, to, to guide. And so that the concept of mentorship and sponsorship, not even, even from non-Latinos or, or, or Caucasian colleagues has been so helpful. I think that's another message in, in, in working with minority business owners or minority employees, whatever it is that there is a role for sponsorship, right? Even if you're not from the community, you can still support someone from that community and build them up and help them find those, those skill sets and that pathway to be successful, to take the next, the next place. Um, Latinos would love any sort of sponsorship. I think any Latino professional would be appreciative of somebody that is not of their culture to say, let me show you a little bit, or let me, let me, let me share with you some things that have worked for me. And so um, I've had that privilege and I'm, I'm, I, I'm so, so grateful to all of that. Um, but there's still struggles, Keith. Um, you know, right now the pay gap for women of color is huge. And um, Latinas are the lowest paying women uh, population right now in the U.S., uh, 57 cents to the, the um, Caucasian workers dollar. Uh, that's huge. We're missing out on millions of dollars in our lifetime and our career. And so there are still some you know, there's still work to be done and uh, we're ready. I think all that's women great. of color, we're ready to do this work. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's an important message, I think, for people to hear <laughs> that. That I love the idea of coming alongside and offering to mentor someone because I think that's such a powerful way to invest in the future of our country and, and of our workforce. Uh, so I love that idea and I encourage people to do that kind of stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I coach people myself and it's, it's, a, it's a, but somebody told me one piece of advice about coaching. And that is, let the person ask you when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So I would encourage people who, who want coaches to look for them because sometimes yeah. they won't volunteer if you don't ask. So, Correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes we have to intentionally look out for allies, Caucasian CEO and leaders that serve a Latino community, serve a Latino workforce. And we tell them we're here to help you. Like, let us help right. you. You know, uh, we're going to we want to teach you about our community further from the fun, fun food and flags concept, like, right? yes, we all like tacos and that's really not always true, but you know, I mean, no, there's more to us than that fun food and flags. And there's, and they also, um, I think people that are not part of your own community, we also have a job to reach out to the communities right. that we are not part of to learn and ask for help and ask for assistance. And that's what the Institute specifically um, wants to do and does is we bring in those that want to learn that are ready um, and bring them into the familia, right? And we tell them, let, let us help you be culturally competent leaders. And, um, and so we've been seeing success with that. And it's great. It's great to see. Not everybody's always ready, Keith, and that's okay. We understand right. that too, you know, and that's okay in this world of diversity, equity, inclusion, not everybody's ready. But those that are, are doing amazing work, amazing work with their workforce. Tell us about your institute since you mentioned it? Yes. So El Puente Institute, again, is the bridge. And so we help organizations, leaders of organizations, be prepared for the new workforce. The Latino workforce right now is huge and booming. And so by 2050, Latinos will make up 29% of the U.S. population. So we are the largest minority population. Um, by 2030, Latinos will be 23% of the workforce. So if Organizations are not already strategically thinking on how to recruit 
Latinos into their pipeline, they're going to be missing out on a large workforce, a workforce that is ready to work. I mean, our work ethic is phenomenal. We are educated a lot. We're, you know, our, our rates of graduation educational attainment is growing, especially amongst Latinas. Um, and so if they're not already looking at that and trying to understand that workforce, they're going to miss out. Also, you know, Latinos are young. Our median age right now is 29.8 compared to the rest of the, the, the population, which I believe is even higher, like in the 50s or 40s ish. Um, I don't have that exact number. We are the, the youngest ready to work, going to be part of the workforce for a long time. Um, these are important numbers that leaders should be looking at at the moment. Unfortunately, Keith, we see that it's not, they're not business imperative numbers. But we at the Institute are here to tell um, leaders that they are business imperative because if you start adding up the workforce that you're not going to be recruiting and not having the skill sets and the cultural competency to do so, you will be looking for workers. Um, and so we always like to connect our strategies to business outcomes and, you know, ROIs of the organization. We understand that's important. And so the Institute really focuses on doing that. We work with the Latino leader to create um, understanding of what Latino leadership looks like from their own lived experience. And then we work with our non-Latino leaders, CEOs and, and um, C-suite leaders to understand the workforce and their clientele if they are serving a Latino client. So a lot of great work is being done, research as well. Um, and we're, we are privileged to be part of this, this community and um, it's me and two other Latina, uh, we call us doctoras, doctors, that opened the Institute just this uh, past year and already see the amazing success. And we're, we're looking for new clients. And so if you, anybody is out there that needs any assistance with your Latino workforce or clientele, please, please don't hesitate to ask. You know, Keith, people always tell us, well, it's because you're doctors. And we're like, okay, so we're doctors. So yes, we have this, you know, <laughs> level of education. But we're still fun and we still can, you know, create different things. I don't I think the doctor thing kind of intimidates people, but please don't be intimidated by our titles and our accolades. Um, we are really passionate about the work that we do. So that is awesome, Dr. Tanya. So Thank you. what are you excited about in this season of your life? Oh, so yes, 2024 looks very bright and promising um, for us at the Institute as we continue to partner with different um, clients and organizations and industries. Construction being one of the ones that we're most excited in because we know there's a large Latino presence in the construction industry. And so we are working with uh, different clients in that industry. Um, I think there's just, there's a shift that's happening in our Latino community. Um, our voices are getting louder. We're ready to be seen. Um, I think collectively we're wanting to work together. You know, we admire the African-American community for their unity and showing up in places together. Um, so we, we thank them because, and we know that that's needed in this time of, of you know, different opinions, <laughs> let's say our beliefs that's happening in, you know, in our country. Um, but we're ready. And so I do see a lot of, of um, hope and um uh, a shift in our community coming out. And for us as, um, as CEOs of our own company, seeing a different, you know, being able to continue our work and being able to creating impact with our clients as well as the communities that we impact. So a lot of great stuff going to happen in 2024. I'd love to ask my guests this question. As you think about and reflect on your impact, what do you want your legacy to be? Mm. Oh, legacy is such a great, a great, great word. And, um, you know, I think about people that represent legacy um, and it can look different for different people. Um, we think about legacy like in, I think about legacy, I think about Michelle Obama, like the legacy that she, she does. Um, Judge Sotomayor, um, women that have come before us, right? And that are doing even work now and in, in the community. Um, I think of legacy of my grandmother. Um, so legacy, I think, represents a lot. I even get, um, you're going to make me get choked up, Keith. Does this happen to your guests in this question? It, it does. It, it's, like, it's like the Maury Povey, so people cry a lot in my show. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
for me, I think um, the legacy is to be able to do what I know I need to do for the benefit of my family, my community, um, the people that are that don't have a voice, um, creating opportunities for those and um, and following again and paving that path for many others to come after me. Um, so I think that's if I can do that and I hope I think I'm on the right track in doing that. Um, and that my daughter is proud, then I think, yeah, and that's legacy. So. That's awesome. Jeez, is there anything I like haven't it. asked you that I should have asked you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, my, my tears here as we're... Um, that's right. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that... Um, thank you for the opportunity for this platform to be able to talk about my institute, to be able to talk about um, also the research and the work that we do at the Bridgify Group. And I encourage, you know, the only thing your listeners to, if they're, especially in this space of diversity, equity, inclusion, to not, not feel, step out of your comfort zone, right? And if you need to, to learn about a particular community, to do so. And we are a very easy, easy place to start. And so we encourage those listeners to come to us. You can reach me on LinkedIn, Dr. Patty Delgado. Um, you can also find El Puente Institute and also the Bridgify Group. On the, on the web as well. Um, I think, Keith, you have my information too. If you like to share, happy to post that information. I think the more that we continue showcasing the resources available to the business world, to the corporate, nonprofit, higher education, um, all the institutes that are interacting with the Latino community, understand there's resources available to you. Um, uh, I think that's so important because a lot of the times we hear people say, well, there's not enough Latino talent or there's not really enough help. And I'm like, well, there really is a lot. <laughs> like there's a lot of Latino associations like out there nationally, right? Um, us that are doing this kind of work. It's just, you know, it's a matter of looking, but we're a very warm place, a very welcome, welcoming place with a lot of psychological safety around us to invite those that, that, um, that know they need to come to learn about the Latino community away from the food, fun, and flags, but really what motivates us. And so we have those answers. Thank you so much. I think for having this conversation, for being as open as you are and as welcoming as you are, because I think as we have more and more of these kinds of conversations with each other, we break down some of the things you mentioned most. I think fear holds us back so much okay. to welcoming new people, new communities, diversity, because we're afraid, will they accept us? Will they won't? Mm -hmm. And we already come with, you know, with, with our, with our defenses up. And if mm -hmm. we can just learn to get beyond, like you said, the food flag and food fighting flags, <laughs> food fighting flag. Yes. I think we, I think we can really begin to, as you also said, realize that we all have to put our shovel into the road to build a new road that's going to be for the future. And we all have a part in that. And we have to do that side by side. Uh, and if we see that as, as that our goal as people, I think we can really begin to be progress in a positive way. Right. And realizing there's a lot of intersections that we didn't even talk about intersectionality. Oh, my God. That's a whole nother thing. Maybe we can yeah, do yeah. that later. <laughs> right. The intersectionality between all our different cultural beliefs that probably intersect with other cultural beliefs. And so that also to connects us more than than we think. And so finding those connections and where those intersections are happening will just create that unity that's required um, for us to do the work that we do in diversity yeah. and inclusion and in working in, in, in our own communities. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dr. Pei, thank you so much for what thank you do. You, Blessings. Keith. And may you have a blessed Christmas as well. Thank you. Um, and and love to stay in touch with you and have you back on later on and talk some more because it was a great conversation. Yes, would love to anytime. Please always reach out. And thank you to your listeners for their time as well.